brought to you by wikivd.com. Silk Road the Silk Road A Silk Route was an ancient network of trade routes that were for centuries central to cultural interaction originally through regions of Eurasia connecting the east and west, and stretching from the Korean Peninsula and Japan to the Mediterranean Sea. The Silk Road concept refers to both the terrestrial and the maritime routes connecting Asia and Europe. The overland steppe route stretching through the Eurasian steppe is considered the ancestor to the Silk Road. While the term is of modern coinage the Silk Road derives its name from the lucrative trade in silk carried out along its length beginning during the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty expanded Central Asian sections of the trade routes around 114 BCE largely through missions and explorations of the Chinese imperial envoy Zhang Qian. The Chinese took great interest in the safety of their trade products and extended the Great Wall of China to ensure the protection of the trade route. Trade on the Silk Road played a significant role in the development of the civilizations of China. The Goguryeo Kingdom Japan, the Indian subcontinent Persia, Europe, the Horn of Africa and Arabia. Opening long-distance political and economic relations between the civilizations. Though silk was certainly the major trade item exported from China, many other goods were traded. As well as religions, syncretic philosophies and various technologies. Diseases most notably plague, also spread along the silk routes. In addition to economic trade the Silk Road was a route for cultural trade among the civilizations along its network. The main traders during antiquity included the Chinese Arabs, Indian Somalis, Syrians, Jews, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Georgians, Armenians, Bactrians, Turkmens and the Sogdians. In June 2014, UNESCO designated the Chang'an Tianshan Corridor of the Silk Road as a World Heritage Site. The Indian portion is on the tentative site list. Name The Silk Road derives its name from the lucrative Eurasian silk and horse trade a major reason for the connection of trade routes into an extensive transcontinental network. The German terms and were coined by Ferdinand von Richthofen who made seven expeditions to China from 1868 to 1872. The term Silk Route is also used. Although the term was coined in the 19th century, it did not gain widespread acceptance in academia or popularity among the public until the 20th century. The first book entitled The Silk Road was by Swedish geographer Sven Hedin in 1938. The Fall of the Soviet Union and Iron Curtain in 1989 led to a surge of public and academic interest in Silk Road sites and studies in the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. Use of the term Silk Road is not without its detractors. For instance, Warwick Bull contends that the maritime spice trade with India and Arabia was far more consequential for the economy of the Roman Empire than the silk trade with China which at sea was conducted mostly through India and on land was handled by numerous intermediaries such as the Sogdians, going as far as to call the whole thing a myth. Of modern academia Ball argues that there was no coherent overland trade system and no free movement of goods from East Asia to the West until the period of the Mongol Empire. He notes that traditional authors discussing East-West trade such as Marco Polo and Edward Gibbon never labeled any route as a silk one in particular. However, that spice trade route was actually the maritime route of what is now considered the Silk Road. Chinese and Central Asian Contacts Central Eurasia has been known from ancient times for its horse riding and horse breeding communities, and the overland steppe route across the northern steppes of central Eurasia was in use long before that of the Silk Road. Archaeological sites such as the Beryl Burial Ground in Kazakhstan 
confirmed that the nomadic Harry Maspians were not only breeding horses for trade, but also great craftsmen able to propagate exquisite art pieces along the Silk Road. From the second millennium BCE, nephrite jade was being traded from mines in the region of Yarkand and Khotan to China. Significantly, these mines were not very far from the lapis lazuli and spinel mines in Badakhshan, and although separated by the formidable Pamir Mountains, routes across them were apparently in use from very early times. Some remnants of what was probably Chinese silk dating from 1070 BCE have been found in ancient Egypt. The great oasis cities of Central Asia played a crucial role in the effective functioning of the silk road trade. The originating source seems sufficiently reliable but silk degrades very rapidly, so it cannot be verified whether it was cultivated silk or a type of wild silk which might have come from the Mediterranean region of the Middle East. Following contacts between metropolitan China and nomadic western border territories in the 8th century BCE, gold was introduced from Central Asia and Chinese jade carvers began to make imitation designs of the steppes, adopting the Scythian-style animal art of the steppes. This style is particularly reflected in the rectangular belt plaques made of gold and bronze, with other versions in jade and steatite. The tomb of a Scythian prince near Stuttgart, Germany, dated to the 6th century BCE, was excavated and found to have not only Greek bronzes, but also Chinese silks, similar animal-shaped pieces of art and wrestler motifs on belts have been found in Scythian grave sites stretching from the Black Sea region all the way to Warring States-era archaeological sites in Inner Mongolia and Shaanxi in China. The expansion of Scythian cultures stretching from the Hungarian plain and the Carpathian mountains to the Chinese Kansu corridor and linking the Middle East with northern India and the Punjab, undoubtedly played an important role in the development of the Silk Road. Scythians accompanied the Assyrian Ezahaddon on his invasion of Egypt, and their distinctive triangular arrowheads have been found as far south as Aswan. These nomadic pe peoples were dependent upon neighboring settled populations for a number of important technologies and in addition to raiding vulnerable settlements. For these commodities, they also encouraged long-distance merchants as a source of income through the enforced payment of tariffs. Softy and Scythian merchants played a vital role in later periods in the development of the Silk Road. Persian Royal Road By the time of Herodotus the royal road of the Persian Empire ran some 2,857 kilometers from the city of Susa on the Karen to the port of Smyrna on the Aegean Sea. It was maintained and protected by the Achaemenid Empire and had postal stations and relays at regular intervals. By having fresh horses and riders ready at each relay royal couriers could carry messages and traverse the length of the road in nine days while normal travelers took about three months. Hellenistic era. The next major step in the development of the Silk Road was the expansion of the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great into Central Asia. In August 329 BCE, at the mouth of the Fergana Valley in Tajikistan across the mountain pass, from the modern Chinese province of Xinjiang Alexander founded the city of Alexandria Eskator, Alexandria the Furthest. This later became a major staging point on the northern Silk Route. See Day 1. The Greeks remained in Central Asia for the next three centuries, first through the administration of the Seleucid Empire and then with the establishment of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom in Bactria and the later Indo-Greek Kingdom in modern northern Pakistan and Afghanistan. They continued to expand eastward especially during the reign of Euthydemus, who extended his control beyond Alexandria Escort to Sogdiana, 
There are indications that he may have led expeditions as far as Kashka in Chinese Turkestan, leading to the first known contacts between China and the West around 200 BCE. The Greek historian Strabo writes they extended their empire even as far as the Seers and the Phrenae. The Hellenistic world and classical Greek philosophy mixed with Eastern philosophies leading to syncretisms such as Greco-Buddhism. Chinese exploration of Central Asia With the Mediterranean linked to the Fergana Valley the next step was to open a route across the Tarim Basin and the Hexi Corridor to China proper. This extension came around 130 BCE with the embassies of the Han Dynasty to Central Asia following the reports of the ambassador Zhang Qian. Zhang Qian visited directly the Kingdom of Daewan in Fergana, the territories of the Yuezhi in Transoxiana the Bactrian country of Daxia, with its remnants of Greco-Bactrian rule in Kangju. He also made reports on neighboring countries that he did not visit such as Zhangxi Tiaoji, Shandu and the Wusun. Zhang Qian's report suggested the economic reason for Chinese expansion and wall building westward, and trailblazed the Silk Road which is one of the most famous trade routes. After the defeat of the Xiongnu however Chinese armies established themselves in Central Asia, initiating the Silk Route as a major avenue of international trade. Some say that the Chinese Emperor Wu became interested in developing commercial relationships with the sophisticated urban civilizations of Fergana Bactria and the Parthian Empire. The Son of Heaven on hearing all this reason thus, Fergana and the possessions of Bactria and Parthian Empire are large countries full of rare things, with a population living in fixed abodes and given two occupations somewhat identical with those of the Chinese people but with weak armies, and placing great value on the rich produce of China. Others say that Emperor Wu was mainly interested in fighting the Xiongnu, and that major trade began only after the Chinese pacified the Hexi Corridor. China snatched control of the Silk Road from the Xiongnu when the Chinese general Chen Qi installed himself as protector of the Tarim at Wu Lei situated between Kara Shah and Kucha. China's control of the Silk Road at the time of the later Han, by ensuring the freedom transcontinental trade along the double chain of oases north and south of the Tarim favored the dissemination of Buddhism in the river basin and, with it Indian literature and Hellenistic art, the Chinese were also strongly attracted by the tall and powerful horses in the possession of the Daewan, which were of capital importance in fighting the nomadic Xiongnu. The Chinese subsequently sent numerous embassies around ten every year to these countries, and as far as Seleucid Syria, thus more embassies were dispatched to Anxi, Parthia, Yansai, who later joined the Alans, Legion, Syria under the Greek Seleucids, Tiaoji, and Tianju, northwestern India. As a rule, rather more than ten such missions went forward in the course of a year and at the least five or six. These connections marked the beginning of the Silk Road trade network that extended to the Roman Empire. The Chinese campaigned in Central Asia on several occasions, and direct encounters between Han troops and Roman legionaries are recorded, particularly in the 36 BCE Battle of Sogdiana. It has been suggested that the Chinese crossbow was transmitted to the Roman world on such occasions, although the Greek Gastrophetes provides an alternative origin. R. Ernest Dupuis and Trevor N. Dupuis suggests that in 36 BCE a Han expedition into Central Asia west of Jaxartes River apparently encountered and defeated a contingent of Roman legionaries. The Romans may have been part of Antony's army invading Parthia, Sogdiana east of the Oxus River. On the Polytimptus River was apparently the most easterly penetration ever made by Roman forces in Asia. The margin of Chinese victory appears to have been their crossbows, 
whose bolts and darts seem easily to have penetrated Roman shields and armor. The Roman historian Florus also describes the visit of numerous envoys which included seers to the first Roman Emperor Augustus who reigned between 27 BCE and 14 CE, the Han army regularly policed the trade route against nomadic bandit forces, generally identified as Zhongnu. Han General Ban Chao led an army of 70,000 mounted infantry and light cavalry troops in the 1st century CE to secure the trade routes reaching far west to the Tarim Basin. Ban Chao expanded his conquests across the Pamirs to the shores of the Caspian Sea and the borders of Parthia. It was from here that a Han general dispatched envoy Gan Ying to Dakin. The Silk Road essentially came into being from the 1st century BCE following these efforts by China to consolidate a road to the Western world and India, both through direct settlements in the area of the Tarim Basin and diplomatic relations with the countries of the Dewan Parthians and Bactrians further west. The Silk Roads were a complex network of trade routes that gave people the chance to exchange goods and culture. A maritime silk route opened up between Chinese-controlled Giaokai, probably by the first century. It extended via ports on the coasts of India and Sri Lanka all the way to Roman-controlled ports in Roman Egypt and the Nabataean territories on the northeastern coast of the Red Sea. The earliest Roman glassware bowl found in China was unearthed from a Western Han tomb in Guangzhou dated to the early 1st century BCE, indicating that Roman commercial items were being imported through the South China Sea. According to Chinese dynastic histories it is from this region that the Roman embassies arrived in China. Beginning in 166 CE during the reigns of Marcus Aurelius and Emperor Wan of Han, other Roman glasswares have been found in Eastern Han-era tombs more further inland in Nanjing and Luoyang. P.O. Harper asserts that a 2nd or 3rd century Roman gilt silver plate found in Jingyu and Gansu, China, with a central image of the Greco-Roman god Dionysus resting on a feline creature, most likely came via Greater Iran. Valerie Hansen believed that earliest Roman coins found in China date to the 4th century during late antiquity and the Dominate period and come from the Byzantine Empire. However, Warwick Bold highlights the recent discovery of 16 Principate-era Roman coins found in Xi'an that were minted during the reigns of Roman emperors spanning from Tiberius to Aurelian. It is true that these coins were found in China, but they were deposited there in the 20th century not in ancient times, and therefore they do not shed light on historic contacts between China and Rome. Roman golden medallions made during the reign of Antoninus Pius and quite possibly his successor Marcus Aurelius have been found at Oco in southern Vietnam, which was then part of the Kingdom of Fun and bordering the Chinese province of Zhaoji in northern Vietnam. Given the archaeological finds of Mediterranean artifacts made by Louis Malaray in the 1940s, Oco may have been the same site as the port city of Katigara described by Ptolemy in his geography. Although Ferdinand von Richthofen had previously believed it was closer to Hanoi, Roman Empire. Soon after the Roman conquest of Egypt in 30 BCE regular communications and trade between China, Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, Africa and Europe blossomed on an unprecedented scale. The eastern trade routes from the earlier Hellenistic powers and the Arabs that were part of the Silk Road were inherited by the Roman Empire. With control of these trade routes citizens of the Roman Empire would receive new luxuries and greater prosperity for the empire as a whole. The Roman-style glassware discovered in the archaeological sites of Jiangju 
capital of the Silla Kingdom showed that Roman artifacts were, were traded as far as the Korean peninsula. The Greco-Roman trade with India started by Eudoxus of Cyzicus in 130 BCE continued to increase and according to Strabo by the time of Augustus up to 120 ships were setting sail every year from Myas Hormos in Roman Egypt to India. The Roman Empire connected with the Central Asian Silk Road through their ports in Berigaza and Barbaricum and continued along the western coast of India. An ancient travel guide to this Indian Ocean trade route was the Greek Periplus of the Erythrian Sea written in 60 CE. The traveling party of mice Titianus penetrated farthest east along the Silk Road from the Mediterranean world probably with the aim of regularizing contacts and reducing the role of middlemen during one of the lulls in Rome's intermittent wars with Parthia, which repeatedly obstructed movement along the Silk Road. Intercontinental trade and communication became regular organized and protected by the great powers. Intense trade with the Roman Empire soon followed confirmed by the Roman craze for Chinese silk. Even though the Romans thought silk was obtained from trees, this be belief was affirmed by Seneca the Younger in his Phaedra and by Virgil in his Georgics. Notably, Pliny the Elder knew better. Speaking of the bombyx a silk moth he wrote in his Natural Histories. They weave webs like spiders that become a luxurious clothing material for women called silk. The Romans traded spices, glassware, perfumes and silk. Roman artisans began to replace yarn with valuable plain silk cloths from China and the Silla Kingdom in Jiangju, Korea. Chinese wealth grew as they delivered silk and other luxury goods to the Roman Empire, whose wealthy Roman women admired their beauty. The Roman Senate issued in vain several edicts to prohibit the wearing of silk on economic and moral grounds. The import of Chinese silk caused a huge outflow of gold, and silk clothes were considered to be decadent and immoral. The Roman Empire and its demand for sophisticated Asian products crumbled in the West around the 5th century. The unification of Central Asia and Northern India within Kushan Empire in the 1st to 3rd centuries reinforced the role of the powerful merchants from Bactria and Taxila. They fostered multicultural interaction as indicated by their 2nd century treasure hoards filled with products from the Greco-Roman world China and India such as in the archaeological site of Bagram, Byzantine Empire. Byzantine Greek historian Procopius stated that two Nestorian Christian monks eventually uncovered the way of how silk was made. From this revelation monks were sent by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian as spies on the Silk Road from Constantinople to China and back to steal the silkworm eggs resulting in silk production in the Mediterranean, particularly in Thrace in northern Greece, and giving the Byzantine Empire a monopoly on silk production in medieval Europe. In 568 the Byzantine ruler Justin II was greeted by a Sogdian embassy representing Istami, ruler of the Turkic Khaganate who formed an alliance with the Byzantines against Khosrau I of the Sasanian Empire that allowed the Byzantines to bypass the Sasanian merchants and trade directly with the Sogdians for purchasing Chinese silk. Although the Byzantines had already procured silkworm eggs from China by this point, the quality of Chinese silk was still far greater than anything produced in the West a fact that is perhaps emphasized by the discovery of coins minted by Justin II found in a Chinese tomb of Shanxi province dated to the Sui dynasty. Both the Old Book of Tang and New Book of Tang, covering the history of the Chinese Tang dynasty, record that a new state called Fulin was virtually identical to the previous Dakin. Several Fulin embassies were recorded for the Tang period starting in 643 with an alleged embassy 
by Constance II to the court of Emperor Taizong of Tang. The history of Song describes the final embassy and its arrival in 1081 apparently sent by Michael VII Dokas to the court of Emperor Shenzong of the Song dynasty. However, the history of Yuan claims that a Byzantine man became a leading astronomer and physician in Khan Balik at the court of Kublai Khan Mongol founder of the Yuan dynasty, and was even granted the noble title, Prince of Fuelin. The Uyghur Nestorian Christian diplomat Raban Basauma, who set out from his Chinese home in Khan Balik and acted as a representative for Argon, traveled throughout Europe and attempted to secure military alliances with Edward I of England, Philip IV of France, Pope Nicholas IV, as well as the Byzantine ruler Andronikos II Paleologos. Andronikos II had two half-sisters who were married to great-grandsons of Genghis Khan, which made him an in-law with the Yuan dynasty Mongol ruler in Beijing, Kublai Khan. The history of Ming preserves an account where the Hongu Emperor, after founding the Ming dynasty, had a supposed Byzantine merchant named Nieh Kulun deliver his proclamation about the establishment of a new dynasty to the Byzantine court of John V Paleologos in September 1371. Friedrich Hirth Emil Brechtschneider, and more recently Edward Lutwak presumed that this was none other than Nicolaus de Bentra, a Roman Catholic bishop of Carnvillac chosen by Pope John XXII to replace the previous Archbishop John of Montecorvino. Tang Dynasty reopens the route. Although the Silk Road was initially formulated during the reign of Emperor Wu of Han, it was reopened by the Tang Empire in 639 when Hao Janji conquered the western regions and remained open for almost four decades. It was closed after the Tibetans captured it in 678, but in 699 during Empress Wu's period the Silk Road reopened. When the Tang reconquered the four garrisons of Anxi originally installed in 640, once again connecting China directly to the West for land-based trade, the Tang captured the vital route through the Gilgit Valley from Tibet in 722, lost it to the Tibetans in 737, and regained it under the command of the Gogyo Korean general Gao Xiangji. While the Turks were settled in the Ordos region, the Tang government took on the military policy of dominating the central steppe. The Tang Dynasty conquered and subdued Central Asia during the 640s and 650s. During Emperor Taizong's reign alone large campaigns were launched against not only the Gok Turks, but also separate campaigns against the two Yuhun, the Asia states and the Zue and Tuo. Under Emperor Taizong Tang General Li Jing conquered the eastern Turkic Khaganate. Under Emperor Gao Zong Tang General Su Ding Fang conquered the Western Turkic Khaganate, which was an important ally of Byzantine Empire. After these conquests, the Tang Dynasty fully controlled the Xiyi, which was the strategic location astride the Silk Road. This led the Tang Dynasty to reopen the Silk Road. The Tang Dynasty established a second Pax Sinica and the Silk Road reached its golden age whereby Persian and Sogdian merchants benefited from the commerce between East and West. At the same time the Chinese Empire welcomed foreign cultures, making it very cosmopolitan in its urban centers. In addition to the land route, the Tang Dynasty also developed the Maritime Silk Route. Chinese envoys had been sailing through the Indian Ocean to India since perhaps the 2nd century BCE yet it was during the Tang Dynasty that a strong Chinese maritime presence could be found in the Persian Gulf and Red Sea into Persia, Mesopotamia, Arabia, Egypt, Aksum and Somalia in the Horn of Africa. Medieval The Silk Road represents an early phenomenon of political and cultural integration due 
to inter-regional trade. In its heyday, it sustained an international culture that strung together groups as diverse as the Magyars, Armenians and Chinese. The Silk Road reached its peak in the West during the time of the Byzantine Empire, in the Nilox's section from the Sassanid Empire period to the Ilkhanate period, and in the Sinitic zone from the Three Kingdoms period to the Yuan Dynasty period. Trade between East and West also developed across the Indian Ocean, between Alexandria in Egypt and Guangzhou in China. Persian Sassanid coins emerged as a means of currency just as valuable as silk yarn and textiles. Under its strong integrating dynamics on the one hand, and the impacts of change it transmitted on the other, tribal societies previously living in isolation along the Silk Road, and pastoralists who were of barbarian cultural development were drawn to the riches and opportunities of the civilizations connected by the routes taking on the trades of marauders or mercenaries. Many barbarian tribes became skilled warriors able to conquer rich cities and fertile lands and to forge strong military empires. The Sogdians dominated the east-west trade after the 4th century up to the 8th century, with Suyab and Talas ranking among their main centers in the north. They were the main caravan merchants of Central Asia. Their commercial interests were protected by the resurgent military power of the Gokturks whose empire has been described as the joint enterprise of the Ashina clan and the Sofdians. A. V. Daibo noted that according to historians the main driving force of the Great Silk Road were not just Sogdians but the carriers of a mixed Sogdian Turkic culture that often came from mixed families. Their trade with some interruptions continued in the 9th century within the framework of the Uyur Empire, which until 840 extended across northern Central Asia and obtained from China enormous deliveries of silk in exchange for horses. At this time caravans of Sogdians traveling to Upper Mongolia are mentioned in Chinese sources. They played an equally important religious and cultural role. Part of the data about Eastern Asia provided by Muslim geographers of the 10th century actually goes back to Sogdian data of the period 750,840, and thus shows the survival of links between East and West. However, after the end of the Uyur Empire Sogdian trade went through a crisis. What mainly issued from Muslim Central Asia was the trade of the Samanids which resumed the northwestern road leading to the Khazars and the Urals and the northeastern one toward the nearby Turkic tribes. The Silk Road gave rise to the clusters of military states of nomadic origins in North China ushered the Nestorian, Manichaean, Buddhist and later Islamic religions into Central Asia and China. Islamic Era in the Silk Road By the Umayyad era, Damascus had overtaken Cte Siphon as a major trade center until the Abbasid dynasty built the city of Baghdad which became the most important city along the Silk Road. At the end of its glory, the routes brought about the largest continental empire ever, the Mongol Empire, with its political centers strung along the Silk Road, realizing the political unification of zones previously loosely and intermittently connected by material and cultural goods. The Islamic world was expanded into Central Asia during the 8th century under the Umayyad Caliphate while its successor the Abbasid Caliphate put a halt to Chinese westward expansion. At the Battle of Talas in 751, however following the disastrous Lushan Rebellion and the conquest of the western regions by the Tibetan Empire, the Tang Empire was unable to reassert its control over Central Asia. Contemporary Tang authors noted how the dynasty had gone into decline after this point. In 848 the Tang Chinese led by the commander Zhang Yi Chao were only able to reclaim the Hexi Corridor and Dunhuang in Gansu from the Tibetans. 
the Persian Samanid Empire centered in Bukhara continued the trade legacy of the Sogdians. The disruptions of trade were curtailed in that part of the world by the end of the 10th century, and conquests of Central Asia by the Turkic Islamic Karakhanid Khanate yet Nestorian Christianity. Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism and Buddhism in Central Asia virtually disappeared. During the early 13th century, Khwarezmir was invaded by the early Mongol Empire. The Mongol ruler Genghis Khan had the once vibrant cities of Bukhara and Samarkand burned to the ground after besieging them. However, in 1370 Samarkand saw a revival as the capital of the new Timurid Empire. The Turco-Mongol ruler Timur forcefully moved artisans and intellectuals from across Asia to Samarkand making it one of the most important trade centers and cultural entrepots of the Islamic world. Mongol Age The Mongol expansion throughout the Asian continent from around 1207 to 1360 helped bring political stability and re-establish the Silk Road. It also brought an end to the dominance of the Islamic Caliphate over world trade. Because the Mongols came to control the trade routes, trade circulated throughout the region. Though they never abandoned their nomadic lifestyle, the Mongol rulers wanted to establish the capital on the Central Asian steppe, so to accomplish this goal, after every conquest they enlisted local people to help them construct and manage their empire. The Mongol diplomat Raban Bar Salma visited the courts of Europe in 1287-88 and provided a detailed written report to the Mongols. Here around the same time, the Venetian explorer Marco Polo became one of the first Europeans to travel the Silk Road to China. His tales documented in the travels of Marco Polo opened Western eyes to some of the customs of the Far East. He was not the first to bring back stories, but he was one of the most widely read. He had been preceded by numerous Christian missionaries to the East such as William of Rubruck, Benedict Pollack, Giovanni da Pian del Carpine, and Andrew of Longjumeu. Later envoys included Odoric of Pordenone, Giovanni da Marignoli, John of Montecorvino, Niccolo da Conti and Ibn Battuta a Moroccan Muslim traveler who passed through the present-day Middle East and across the Silk Road from Tabriz between 1325-54. In the 13th century efforts were made at forming a Franco-Mongol alliance with an exchange of ambassadors and attempts at military collaboration in the Holy Land during the later Crusades. Eventually the Mongols in the Ilkhanate after they had destroyed the Abbasid and Ayyubid dynasties converted to Islam and signed the 1323 Treaty of Aleppo. With the surviving Muslim power the Egyptian Mamluks, some studies indicate that the Black Death, which devastated Europe starting in the late 1340s may have reached Europe from Central Asia along the trade routes of the Mongol Empire. One theory holds that Genoese traders coming from the Entrepo of Trebizond in northern Turkey carried the disease to Western Europe. Like many other outbreaks of plague, there is strong evidence that it originated in Marmots in Central Asia and was carried westwards to the Black Sea by Silk Road traders. Decline and Disintegration The fragmentation of the Mongol Empire loosened the political, cultural, and economic unity of the Silk Road. Turk many marching lords seized land around the western part of the Silk Road, from the decaying Byzantine Empire. After the fall of the Mongol Empire, the great political powers along the Silk Road became economically and culturally separated. Accompanying the crystallization of regional states was the declining nomad power partly due to the devastation of the Black Death and partly due to the encroachment of sedentary civilizations equipped with gunpowder. The consolidation of the Ottoman and Safavid empires in the Middle East led to a revival of overland trade interrupted sporadically by warfare between them. 
the silk trade continued to flourish until it was disrupted by the collapse of the Safavid Empire in the 1720s. New Silk Road After an earthquake that hit Tashkent in Central Asia in 1966 the city had to rebuild itself. Although it took a huge toll on the markets this commenced a revival of modern Silk Road cities. The Eurasian Land Bridge is sometimes referred to as the New Silk Road. The last link in one of these two railway routes was completed in 1990, when the railway systems of China and Kazakhstan connected at Alator Pass. In 2008 the line was used to connect the cities of Urumqi in China's Xinjiang province to Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan. In October 2008 the first Trans-Eurasia logistics train reached Hamburg from Jiangtan. Starting in July 2011 the line has been used by a freight service that connects Chongqing, China with Duisburg, Germany cutting travel time for cargo from about 36 days by container ship to just 13 days by freight train. In 2013, Hewlett Packard began moving large freight trains of laptop computers and monitors along this rail route. In September 2013 during a visit to Kazakhstan, Chinese President Xi Jinping introduced a plan for creating a new Silk Road from China to Europe. The latest iterations of this plan dubbed One Belt One Road includes a land-based Silk Road economic belt and maritime Silk Road with primary points in Urumqi, Dostik, Astana, Gomel, Brest and the Polish cities of Malashevica and Łódź, which would be hubs of logistics and transshipment to other countries of Europe. On 15 February 2016 with a change in routing, the first train dispatched under the OBOR scheme arrived from eastern Zhejiang province to Tehran. Though this section does not complete the Silk Road-style overland connection between China and Europe plans are underway to extend the route past Tehran through Istanbul into Europe. The actual route went through Almaty, Bishkek, Samarkand and Dushanbe. In January 2017, the service sent its first train to London. The network additionally connects to Madrid and Milan. Routes The Silk Road consisted of several routes, as it extended westwards, from the ancient commercial centers of China the Overland. Intercontinental Silk Road divided into northern and southern routes bypassing the Takalimukan Desert and Lop Nur. Northern Route The Northern Route started at Chang'an, an ancient capital of China that was moved further east during the later Han to Luoyang. The route was defined around the 1st century BCE when Han Wudi put an end to harassment by nomadic tribes. The Northern Route traveled northwest through the Chinese province of Gansu from Shaanxi province and split into three further routes two of them following the mountain ranges to the north and south of the Takalimukan Desert to rejoin at Kashgar and the other going north of the Qian Shan Mountains through Turpentalga and Almaty. The route split again west of Kashgar, with the southern branch heading down the Alai Valley towards Terms and Bork, while the other traveled through Kokand in the Fergana Valley, and then west across the Karakum Desert. Both routes joined the main southern route before reaching ancient Merv Turkmenistan. Another branch of the northern route turned northwest past the Aral Sea and north of the Caspian Sea then and on to the Black Sea, a route for caravans. The northern Silk Road brought to China many goods such as dates, saffron powder, and pistachio nuts from Persia, frankincense aloes and myrrh from Somalia, sandalwood from India, glass bottles from Egypt and other expensive and desirable goods from other parts of the world. In exchange the caravans sent back bolts of silk brocade lacquerware and porcelain. Southern Route The Southern Route, a Karakoram route, was mainly a single route running from China through the Karakoram Mountains. 
where it persists in modern times as the international paved road connecting Pakistan and China as the Karakoram Highway. It then set off westwards but, with southward spurs enabling the journey to be completed by sea from various points. Crossing the high mountains it passed through northern Pakistan over the Hindu Kush mountains and into Afghanistan rejoining the northern route near Merv Turkmenistan. From Merv, it followed a nearly straight line west through mountainous northern Iran Mesopotamia and the northern tip of the Syrian desert to the Levant, where Mediterranean trading ships plied regular routes to Italy, while land routes went either north through Anatolia or south to North Africa. Another branch road traveled from Herat through Susa to Karak Spadinu, at the head of the Persian Gulf and across to Petra and on to Alexandria, and other eastern Mediterranean ports from where ships carried the cargoes to Rome. Southwestern Route The southwestern route is believed to be the Ganges, Brahmaputra Delta, which has been the subject of international interest for over two millennia. Strabo, the first-century Roman writer mentions the Deltaic lands regarding merchants who now sail from Egypt. As far as the Ganges they are only private citizens. His comments are interesting as Roman beads and other materials are being found. At Wari Bhattashwa ruins the ancient city with roots from much earlier before the Bronze Age, presently being slowly excavated beside the old Brahmaputra in Bangladesh. Ptolemy's map of the Ganges Delta, a remarkably accurate effort, showed that his informants knew all about the course of the Brahmaputra River, crossing through the Himalayas then bending westward to its source in Tibet. It is doubtless that this delta was a major international trading center almost certainly from much earlier than the Common Era. Gemstones and other merchandise from Thailand and Java were traded in the delta and through it. Chinese archaeological writer Bin Yang and some earlier writers and archaeologists such as Janice Stargart strongly suggest this route of international trade as Sichuan Yunnan Burma Bangladesh route. According to Bin Yang especially from the 12th century the route was used to ship bullion from Yunnan through northern Burma into modern Bangladesh making use of the ancient route known as the Ledo route. The emerging evidence of the ancient cities of Bangladesh in particular Wari Bhattashwa ruins Mahistan and Garbitagar by Krampur Garrison Dor and Sonargaon are believed to be the international trade centers in this route. Maritime Route Maritime Silk Road and Maritime Silk Route refer to the maritime section of historic Silk Road that connects China to Southeast Asia. Indonesian archipelago, Indian subcontinent, Arabian Peninsula, all the way to Egypt, and finally Europe. The trade route encompassed numbers of bodies of waters, including South China Sea, Strait of Malacca, Indian Ocean, Gulf of Bengal, Arabian Sea, Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea. The maritime route overlaps with historic Southeast Asian maritime trade. Spice trade, Indian Ocean trade, and after 8th century, the Arabian naval trade network. The network also extends eastward to East China Sea and Yellow Sea to connect China with Korean Peninsula and Japanese archipelago. Cultural exchanges. Richard Fultz, Shinru Lu, and others have described how trading activities along the Silk Road over many centuries facilitated the transmission not just of goods but also ideas and culture. Notably in the area of religions, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, Manichaeism, and Islam all spread across Eurasia through trade networks that were tied to specific religious communities and their institutions. Notably, established Buddhist monasteries along the Silk Road offered a haven as well as a new religion for foreigners. 
the spread of religions and cultural traditions along the Silk Roads according to Jerry H. Bentley also led to syncretism. One example was the encounter with the Chinese and Zhongyu nomads. These unlikely events of cross-cultural contact allowed both cultures to adapt to each other as an alternative. The Zhongyu adopted Chinese agricultural techniques, dress style, and lifestyle, while the Chinese adopted Zhongyu military techniques, some dress style, music, and dance. Perhaps most surprising of the cultural exchanges between China and the Zhongyu, Chinese soldiers would sometimes defect and convert to the Zhongyu way of life and stay in the steppes for fear of punishment. Transmission of Christianity The transmission of Christianity was primarily known as Nestorianism on the Silk Road. In 781, an inscribed stele shows Nestorian Christian missionaries arriving on the Silk Road. Christianity had spread both east and west simultaneously bringing Syriac language and evolving the forms of worship. Transmission of Buddhism the transmission of Buddhism to China via the Silk Road began in the 1st century CE according to a semi-legendary account of an ambassador sent to the West by the Chinese Emperor Ming. During this period Buddhism began to spread throughout Southeast East and Central Asia, Mahayana, Theravada, and Tibetan Buddhism are the three primary forms of Buddhism that spread across Asia via the Silk road. The Buddhist movement was the first large-scale missionary movement in the history of world religions. Chinese missionaries were able to assimilate Buddhism to an extent to native Chinese Taoists which would bring the two beliefs together. Buddha's community of followers the Sangha consisted of male and female monks and laity. These people moved through India and beyond to spread the ideas of Buddha. As the number of members within the Sangha increased, it became costly so that only the larger cities were able to afford having the Buddha and his disciples visit. It is believed that under the control of the Kushans Buddhism was spread to China and other parts of Asia from the middle of the 1st century to the middle of the 3rd century. Extensive contact started in the 2nd century probably as a consequence of the expansion of the Kushan Empire into the Chinese territory of the Tarim Basin due to the missionary efforts of a great number of Buddhist monks to Chinese lands. The first missionaries and translators of Buddhist scriptures into Chinese were either Parthian, Kushan Sogdi and Akutchian. One result of the spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road was displacement and conflict. The Greek Seleucids were exiled to Iran and Central Asia because of a new Iranian dynasty called the Parthians at the beginning of the 2nd century BCE. And as a result, the Parthians became the new middlemen for trade in a period when the Romans were major customers for silk. Parthian scholars were involved in one of the first ever Buddhist text translations into E. Chinese language. Its main trade center on the Silk Road, the city of Merv in due course and, with the coming of age of Buddhism in China became a major Buddhist center. By the middle of the second century, knowledge among people on the Silk Roads also increased. When Emperor Ashoka of the Maurya dynasty converted to Buddhism and raised the religion to official status in his northern Indian Empire, from the 4th century CE onward. Chinese pilgrims also started to travel on the Silk Road to India to get improved access to the original Buddhist scriptures with F. H. Yen's pilgrimage to India and later Shanzang and Hai Cho who traveled from Korea to India. The travels of the priest Shanzang were fictionalized in the 16th century in a fantasy adventure novel called Journey to the West which told of trials with demons and the aid given by various disciples on the journey. There were many different schools of Buddhism traveling on the Silk Road. 
the Dharmaguptakas, and the Sarvastivadins were two of the major Nikaya schools. These were both eventually displaced by the Mahayana also known as Great Vehicle. This movement of Buddhism first gained influence in the Khotan region. The Mahayana, which was more of a pan-Buddhist movement than a school of Buddhism appears to have begun in northwestern India or Central Asia. It formed during the 1st century BCE and was small at first and the origins of this greater vehicle are not fully clear. Some Mahayana scripts were found in northern Pakistan but the main texts are still believed to have been composed in Central Asia along the Silk Road. These different schools and movements of Buddhism were a result of the diverse and complex influences and beliefs on the Silk Road. With the rise of Mahayana Buddhism, the initial direction of Buddhist development changed. This form of Buddhism highlighted as stated by Shinru Lu the elusiveness of physical reality including material wealth. It also stressed getting rid of material desire to a certain point. This was often difficult for followers to understand. During the 5th and 6th century CE, merchants played a large role in the spread of religion, in particular Buddhism. Merchants found the moral and ethical teachings of Buddhism to be an appealing alternative to previous religions. As a result, merchants supported Buddhist monasteries along the Silk Road, and in return the Buddhists gave the merchants somewhere to stay as they traveled from city to city. As a result, merchants spread Buddhism to foreign encounters as they traveled. Merchants also helped to establish diaspora within the communities they encountered and over time their cultures became based on Buddhism. As a result, these communities became centers of literacy and culture with well-organized marketplaces, lodging, and storage. The voluntary conversion of Chinese ruling elites helped the spread of Buddhism in East Asia and led Buddhism to become widespread in Chinese society. The Silk Road transmission of Buddhism essentially ended around the 7th century, with the rise of Islam in Central Asia. Transmission of Art Many artistic influences were transmitted via the Silk Road particularly through Central Asia, where Hellenistic Iranian Indian and Chinese influences could intermix. Greco-Buddhist art represents one of the most vivid examples of this interaction. Silk was also a representation of art serving as a religious symbol. Most importantly, silk was used as currency for trade along the Silk Road. These artistic influences can be seen in the development of Buddhism where, for instance, Buddha was first depicted as human in the Kushan period. Many scholars have attributed this to Greek influence. The mixture of Greek and Indian elements can be found in later Buddhist art in China and throughout countries on the Silk Road. The production of art consisted of many different items that were traded along the Silk Roads from the east to the west. One common product, the lapis lazuli, was a blue stone with golden specks, which was used as paint after it was ground into powder. Commemoration On the 22nd of June 2014, the United Nations Educational Scientific and cultural organization named the Silk Road a World Heritage Site. At the 2014 Conference on World Heritage, the United Nations World Tourism Organization has been working since 1993 to develop sustainable international tourism along the route, with the stated goal of fostering peace and understanding. Bishkek and Almaty each have a major east-west street named after the Silk Road. Brought to you by Wikivd.com Would you like to know more?